Part of an ancient story of our tradition. This is from the book of Exodus. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what God? What is God's name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. The Reverend Otis Moss III stepped to the podium. Over 3,000 of us had gathered at our 2009 National UCC gathering. We quieted ourselves to listen. Starting off slowly, as is often the case in this style of preaching common in many African-American churches, the senior minister of Trinity UCC in Chicago picked up speed as he spoke of punctuation. That's right, a sermon on punctuation. Inspiring, exciting, huh? <laughs> Semicolons, quotation marks, apostrophes, parentheses, and hold on to your pew, brackets. <laughs> but Otis Moss is no average preacher. Punctuation as he revealed to us, can be relevant and inspiring when the dominant story, the status quo power or culture or system insists on a period while the good news of God insists on a comma. To the drug addict to whom the incarceration system says three strikes and you're out, period, the good news of God says comma, change your direction, comma, God is making all things new. To the Hebrew enslaved, Pharaoh says work without rest or wage for the empire, period. But the good news of God says, comma, together you shall walk out of bondage. Comma, together you shall journey to liberation and a new way of community. To the teacher and healer and prophet Jesus, the Roman Empire said, your way is ended, period. The good news of God says, comma, not so fast. Comma, there is life and resurrection stronger than death. Comma, stronger than violence and the desire to dominate. To the broken spirit whose inner critical voice says, that's it, there's no hope for you, no meaning, period. The good news of God says, comma, my grace is sufficient, comma, nothing is impossible for God. Well, this is the kind of proclamation delivered by the powerful and eloquent Reverend Moss that had us all on our feet by the end of his sermon as we felt the spirit flow through his speaking that our God is in the comma business of making things new, healed and hopeful and resistant to the period makers of the world, those who choose and serve a status quo of fear, hard heartedness, injustice and cynicism. I recently thought of that message delivered by Reverend Moss because, as you heard, it still lives in me, especially when I feel or I see the drift toward hopelessness and loss of possibility. 
And I feel and see that drift now. Climate change marches on. Women's rights to control their bodies is curtailed. Aggressive warmongers on the march. The weapons of war sold to angry and hopeless citizens and then tragically used for mayhem and mass death. Over 20 years ago, our national denomination, the United Church of Christ, was looking for a phrase to define itself. They found the perfect words from the late Gracie Allen, the wife and comic partner of the late comedian George Burns, some of you remember. A brilliant and perceptive woman in her own right, she left a message in her papers to be discovered by her husband after her death. And that note has become the motto for the United Church of Christ, never put a period where God has placed a comma. Gracie was encouraging George to remember that life had many chapters. George was 68 when Gracie died. And rather than place a period after his life and career, Burns went on to star in many things, including a number of movies, even playing God twice. <laughs> he died at age 100, having lived the life of the comma, we might say. Our faith is that kind of faith. Our church is that kind of church. Because many of us come from other kinds of churches or may have few connections with the larger network that is the UCC, I'd like to share about how this characteristic way of being together as the United Church of Christ embodies more of a comma faith than one of periods. One where spirit writes new chapters, where spirit comes to us as an unfolding of new understandings, new expressions of faithful living, and new possibilities for compassion and justice in action. And there are threads of this comma faith woven into the UCC fabric from all the branches of our family tree that came together in 1957 to become one network. Our birthday is every summer. We sort of passed by it a few weeks ago. But the United Church of Christ is not that old. We're a blended family. And our relationship to this unfolding faith comes right out of our ancient faith stories of Scripture, just like this morning. Our Scripture story has Moses at work, if you don't remember chapter 3 of Exodus, although I'm sure you do. <laughs> Perhaps Moses just wanted an ordinary day at work, a simple day of watching and wandering with the sheep, period. But spirits seem to have a different plan. The bush that was burning, comma, but was not consumed, appeared to him and he turned aside to an encounter with the divine. In this encounter, Moses asked the name of the divine. In these ancient stories, having the true or secret name of the deity gave power to the namer to invoke and use the deity's power. And yet here, God refuses to be boxed in by a simple title, a single nature or power, or even by time. The Hebrew wordplay here can be translated as I am what I am or I will be who I will be or maybe most simply I will be whoever I will be. God even refuses to box God's self in with a specific name or power or description. No periods here, just commas. God is free to become and be. And this is all about commas, all about an openness to the divine mystery of what might be coming, what might emerge, what might be needed to serve life, what might be chosen, what new thing might be revealed. The reflective and rational Greek philosophy of the ancient world leaned toward a more static an even impassive understanding of the divine. You know this list. God is on the all-everything list, all-knowing, 
all powerful, right? The whole list. That's not scripture. That's Greek philosophy. And it had a great impact on our tradition and how we read our stories when we looked back at scripture. But Hebrew understandings of God actually were more about the lived experience of the divine and were open to God as moving, morphing, and changing. Like the Hebrew people themselves journeying to the promised land or back from exile, or like the families of Abraham and Sarah or Ruth and Naomi or Joseph and Mary, or like the wise ones from the east following a star, it seems that the people were on an unfolding journey, discerning the new place that spirit called them to go in order to serve life at that time in that situation. We hear the new in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount where he is portrayed by Matthew's community as the new Moses. You can hear the new being indicated by the phrase, you have heard it said, comma, but I say. There is innovation here in Jesus' teaching going beyond something like eye for an eye, which in its day did help to stop escalating revenge cycles to something that went into the inner work that stops cycles of revenge and separation altogether. Something as radical as a teaching that says, love your enemy. You see, although our Bible has a back cover, which is a little dangerous, and the tradition has not admitted new books into the Bible for over a millennium and a half, that does not mean that God is mute that spirit stopped moving or speaking at the time of Jesus or of Moses. God is still speaking, we say, in the UCC. And we, as the UCC, are trying to listen. We don't always, but we have done it before in not too bad a way. In fact, right at the beginning of one of our ancestry marks of faith, a, a great moment of faith in 1620 on their way to North America, pilgrims seeking spiritual freedom heard their pastor John Robinson say, God has yet more light and truth to break forth out of his holy word. This is a statement of the continuing revelation that is characteristic of the UCC, the assumption that there is more understanding to come. It is a way of seeking and holding truth that keeps us open to reading our scriptures and mining our tradition in new ways as our understandings and experience change so we can meet the moment that is now. This kind of way has encouraged us, not exclusively, but characteristically to be on the cutting edge of social change in the church. Congregationalists were among the first Americans to take a stand against slavery, for example. In 1700, the Reverend Samuel Sewell wrote the first anti-slavery pamphlet in America called The Selling of Joseph, and it laid the foundation for the abolitionist movement that came more than a century later. In 1773, 5,000 angry colonists gathered at the Old South Meeting House in Boston, a UCC church to demand repeal of an unjust tax on tea. You heard of this party before? Mm -hmm. It might be called the first act of civil disobedience in US history, the Boston Tea Party. In 1773, a young member of the Old South congregation, Phyllis Wheatley, becomes the first published African-American author. Poems on various subjects was a sensation and Wheatley gained her freedom from slavery soon after. In 1785, Lemuel Haynes was the first African American ordained by a Protestant denomination. In 1839, enslaved Africans broke their chains and seized control of the schooner Amistad. Maybe you know that story. Their freedom was short-lived and they were held in a Connecticut jail while the ship's owners sued them to have them returned as property. But Congregationalists and other Christians organized a campaign to free the captives. The case became a defining moment for the movement to abolish slavery 
as the Supreme Court ruled, the captives are not property. And the Africans regained their freedom. There's so many firsts. I could go on. I think I'll make a shortcut here to let you know it is from this comma faith that these firsts have come. And so the question is for us today, being one expression of the United Church of Christ, what about us? Now let me be clear, I'm not sharing these first, and I could have shared more that went through the 20th century. I'm not sharing them to boost our UCC egos, we're better kind of thing. I'm sharing it to encourage us, to encourage our spirits with so much of the country and some churches wanting to go backward, to fix the faith and the culture in a less inclusive and less just past. Fix it with a period. I share this list to encourage us that the God of commas has been and is at work even amidst the current appearance of reactionary, reactive, and violent forces. And so what about us? How is our comma faith? Where have we placed a period where God would place a comma? Where have we precluded possibility or sidled up to cynicism or jockeyed into judgment or given in to impatience in such a way that we placed a period where spirit was seeking a comma, a new way through, a resurrection? My guess is that often we protect our hearts with the period. We bring the period placing energies of judgment or criticism or cynicism or passivity. Or we protect ourselves and calm our fears in the midst of the anxiety of change by focusing on too much order. We forget that God can work through all of this, even the right kind of chaos. I think the late John Lewis might call the right kind of chaos good trouble. We forget that God may have another timeline or another way to get where we're going. I forget that constantly. I've not been here too long enough to know the full story of Plymouth Church and how you have found ways to do something and become something that others would have thought not possible. But right on our website, I did see a video where the late Ray Becker narrates the story that recounted the German-speaking ancestors of this church escaping Tsar Alexander II, leaving their familiar homes in Russia to come all this way. A video that showed them starting a church without a pastor, that showed them coming together with only 64 members to build a church building, and then the faith years later to sell that building and move all the way out of town to a place called Prospect Avenue <laughs> where they built the whole shell of the church themselves where we now worship when they had 184 members. And now look what you've done. To meet a challenge to support our comma faith ministry we raised last Monday over $75,000 in a single day. So my friends, I know some of you have had difficult days and there may be more for you and for this country and the world. But somewhere, just after the necessary, appropriate, and healthy grieving. Maybe that's part of the breath we take at the comma. Just after that healthy grieving of the disappointments of our world and our lives, there is a time. 
there is a choice to faithfully punctuate our stories with a comma, to re-envision new possibilities of manifesting God's realm here on earth in your life, in northern Colorado, in Plymouth Church, in the whole world. And after we do that, to act, to help that newness to come. As our UCC promotions often say, God is still speaking. And our call is to be listening and discerning and following the still speaking God, who is calling us into a faith where we are placing the life-giving commas of compassion, of courage, and of creativity, where others would place the death-dealing periods of complacency and complicity and resignation. We are invited into an adventure of faith where the comma is always opening us to the renewing of our minds, the reconciliation of the alienated both in ourselves and in others, and a revisioning, a revisioning of any way of being that is less than shalom for all creation. As Gracie said, never place a period where God has placed a comma. Amen.